Look at Romans chapter 9, and we'll read verse 10. Romans chapter 9, and we will read verse 10. There's a heresy called Calvinism. And Calvinism, their favorite chapter is always Romans 9, Romans 9, Romans 9. You'll memorize it like Matthew 24, okay? So Romans 9 is their John 3.16. In Romans 9, it is rich with passages concerning Calvinism. That basically, in Calvinism, remember, God elects or picks and chooses who is saved. And if he picks and chooses who's saved, then that means he will pick and choose who's not saved. Now, Calvinists don't want to say that part. But anyways, we're not going to get technical right here. Uh, I'm just going to speak in more plain language. That way, people online can understand what I'm saying. Okay, so in Calvinism, God picks and chooses who's saved and who's lost. Now, they use the example of Pharaoh. I showed you how to debunk that passage. Now we're going to come to the next passage. The next one they're going to use is Esau and Jacob. We're going to look at Romans chapter 9. And notice right here that it seems like God chose who will be the elect who's saved and who's lost. Esau's lost, Jacob's saved before they were born before they even had the chance to do, use free choice. Let's look at Romans chapter 9 and verse 10. The Bible says, And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. So during the pregnancy, for the children being not yet born, boom, neither having done any good or evil. Look at that. Without any free choice whatsoever, the Lord ordained something that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. So notice right here, Esau is underneath Jacob. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Notice right here, God loved Jacob, saved. He hated Esau. He's going to be lost. So this seems to be a problem right here. But Scripture with Scripture will show. Let's concentrate right here, passage by passage. Now, Calvinists, they always say they want to look at eisegesis, exegesis, or context, context, context. They keep shooting their mouth off about that. And they will accuse Bible believers of playing Bible roulette and going all kinds of verses out, uh, once we expound Romans 9. So keep that in mind. That's how Calvinists will argue. But the thing is this is that what you can argue back is it's not Bible roulette, it's Scripture with Scripture. Amen. That's what it is. God himself can interpret what he said in another passage. He has the right to do that. So that's all you're doing. Now, they want to stick to context. You can tell why. Why do they want to stick to context, meaning only Romans 9? Because they know only Romans 9 would show their belief. That's what they see it as. Outside of that, it's going to destroy Calvinism. So that's why they will stick to Romans 9 and say, look what the author's saying. But here's the thing, is that how you can understand the author, and this is proven in any literature text that you read as well, is that you have to not only look at the context of what the author's writing or stating, but other parts of his or her writings as well to see what he's really intending. So let's do that. Let's look at context and scripture with scripture. So we're not going outside of context, okay? Verse 10, right? When Rebekah was conceiving, okay, so that's the conceiving part, before Jacob and Esau had a chance, right? Verse 11, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Okay, so one by one, verse 11. We see verse 10, okay, we already understand that, but verse 11 seems to be the point. God elected, correct, before birth. Yes? Yes. Okay, this is very simple. Yes, he elected before birth. Jacob rather than Esau. But did it say anything in this verse about salvation? No. Did it say, go to heaven, go to hell? No. It simply said God elected something before birth. See? Boom. Pay attention. He elect. Elect means to choose, right? Does choosing have to be only limited to salvation or in other things? 
other things as well. For example, God can choose uh, me as the, the pastor of the church, and that's what he elected me to be, rather than Brother Sean. He elected Brother Sean to be the member of that church. But I can't read the mind of God. I don't know what God has planned out for Sean. But see, when he elected something, see, he chose what's going to happen. And that has nothing to do with salvation, right? So it doesn't matter what Sean wants to do. Oh, I want to be the big man. I want to take over the church. You know, I, one, I'd be happy to leave it to him and go on vacation, all right? But two, the thing is this, that's impossible if God elected it. Because God says that church is not going to prosper if I elected that person to be the pastor. And you enemies out there, it doesn't matter what you want to do to me. If God elected that for me to happen, to be the pastor of the church, you can't kick me out even if you wanted to. Now, anyways, so that's the point. He chose something before birth. What? What? Now, didn't we read by context? Verse 12, it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. There you go. Verse 12 shows what the election is. So this choosing is not limited to salvation. We saw that. Yes? Yes. Then this election is something else. What is it? Context. Now, look at context, okay? You Calvinists keep harping context, context. So let's do context, okay? Context is what? The elder, Esau, serves the younger, Jacob. That's it. So it doesn't matter what Esau wanted. Remember, Esau had the birthright, uh, but Jacob took the birthright. And Jacob had the right to the birthright because that was elected by God no matter how much Esau wanted it, correct? So God chose Jacob to be the superior nation rather than Esau. And Esau, as the weaker nation, would be submissive to Jacob, to Israel. That's why the, it makes sense. The nation of Israel from Jacob is elected, and it doesn't matter what you replacement theology people say, you can't undo what God elected. He did it even before birth. Even if Jacob didn't want it to, God elected that before birth. So that's what it is. Now, let's look at Scripture with Scripture to build up the argument. Go to Genesis. Now, keep your hand. Keep your hand there at Romans 9. Go to Genesis 25. Genesis chapter 25, verse 22. Genesis chapter 25, verse 22. Scripture with Scripture. So what is Paul quoting from, right? The author is quoting from something here. So let's look at the mind of the author, what he's quoting from. Look at the book of Genesis, chapter 25, and we will read verse 22. And the children struggled together within her. Right? Remember verse 10, uh, Rachel, she had something struggling in her womb, and God elects something. If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said unto her, here's the election. Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. That's the passage Paul was quoting from, correct? Correct. Now, keep that in mind. After verse 23, do you see anything here about salvation? Look at the whole chapter. It had nothing to do with salvation. So the author, when he was quoting from this passage, it had nothing to do with salvation. You know why they were thinking about salvation? Because they automatically assume when God says elect, that means saved. That does not have to be the case. Let's look at... Another one, we're going to look at back at Romans 9. Now, here's the key, okay? This is the verse about salvation here. It's verse 13, okay? Here's the area about salvation. Now, this thing, they assume, pay attention now, they assume this is unconditional. Now, in Calvinism, they have tulip, five points. One of them is unconditional election. They assume here, because this election, which had nothing to do with salvation, this is national election, not salvation election. This is a national election, not salvation election. Now, they think this is unconditional election. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. But here's the thing. When you look at that passage that Paul is quoting, 
when did that happen? Did that happen before birth? That's what they're assuming. If you looked at the book of Genesis that Paul was quoting from, it didn't show that at all. That God said, I hate Jacob. Uh, no, I hate Esau and I love Jacob. You know when he said that? After, long after, they made their choices and decisions. Now look at the book of Malachi. Malachi. Now keep your hand there. Keep your hand there. Go to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. Some of you who don't know, the last book in your Old Testament, right before Matthew. So that'll be easy. Last book in your Old Testament, right before Matthew. Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. And what you're going to find out, the reason why God hated Esau as a lost reprobate, you're going to find out it happened long after, and it's based on a condition. It's based on the condition of the choice of Esau that he rejected God's birthright to begin with. And because he was fleshy. And when God said that, God rejected Esau. Now look at this, Malachi chapter 1, verse 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, whereas hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I love Jacob. Malachi, this is the last book in your Old Testament, totally opposite from the first book in your Old Testament, Genesis where he supposedly ordained hate and love. No, this was long after. Why would God say this part, verse 3? And I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now use your head. Why would he say long after Genesis, I hate Esau and I love Jacob? Because the reason why he said that long after, he saw their lives, the decisions that they made. And based on that, that's why God hated Esau. Look at the book of uh, Genesis 25 and Hebrews 12. Genesis 25 and Hebrews chapter 12. So notice right here how Scripture with Scripture is pointing things to light. What is Esau's reprobation based on? Unconditionally before birth? No, that's the national election who's going to serve who. This one is based on the decision that he made. Look at the book of Genesis chapter 25 and Hebrews chapter 12. Genesis 25 and Hebrews chapter 12. So I will write it down here. We're going to look at verse 34 of chapter 25 and then Hebrews 12 later on. The Bible says right here in chapter 25, verse 34, Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus, notice his action, right? His free choice. Did Esau do it or God did it? Esau. Esau what? Despised his birthright. By dis Look, if you despise what God gives and despise what you are blessed with, don't you think God would despise it, you in return? Thus, look at Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, verse 16. Lest there be any, notice, fornicator or profane person as what? Esau. Why? Why was he a reprobate? Who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright? Boom. Based on that choice he made. That's why he became the reprobate. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. Why? Because remember verse 16, his decision. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. That's really sad and very true even today that you can use. There are people who would repent and weep with bitter tears, but he, it doesn't change the fact no matter how much you cry or feel guilty, it doesn't change the fact crying and feeling guilty does not get you saved. It will never do that. It will never get you saved. There are people who will actually cry and weep, oh, I'm sorry, but says a murderer when he's in front of the court, right? But as soon as you let him go, what's, what's deep down inside his heart? He wants to be like Esau, profane, fornicating. That's what Esau did. He may have said, oh, I'm sorry, stuff like that. But see, deep down inside his heart, he's a fleshy person. Now we're going to look at back at Romans 9 again. Back at Romans 9. Romans chapter 9 and verse 13. Now, here's the thing. 
election before birth. This is where you catch them at, okay? They're going to try to tie this together, okay? That's their tactic. Their tactic is to tie this together so that you don't have an answer. And then they will keep harping on context, context, context. But here's the thing. This is where you can get them on, okay? There is absolutely, okay, which one's the salvation passage? Verse 11? No. Is it verse 12? No. What is it? Verse 13. Yes? Yes. There is absolutely nothing in this passage where you can prove not one shred of evidence in Scripture where you prove right here God hated Esau unconditionally. You can't find a verse anywhere on that. Every verse you find where God hated Esau and why Esau became a reprobate was based on his decision. Not only that, before birth, the election before birth, okay? The election before birth. Can you prove it has to do with salvation? You can't find it anywhere. The election before birth, can you prove it has to do with national election? Yes. You know why? Genesis 25. That's why. Because Paul was quoting from there. So based on context and scripture with scripture, we see right here what Paul is saying. You know what Paul is saying as the author? Paul is saying as the author that God elects and he has the right to elect. And he chooses right here that he's going to choose Esau as the weaker nation and Jacob uh, as the superior nation. And he also points out right here that Esau was hated and then Jacob was loved. Now, why was that? Why was J Jacob loved, Esau hated? Based on his free choice. So that's what Paul is simply saying. Paul is simply saying God elected uh, Jacob before birth that he would be the superior nation. And based on Esau's free choice and decision, the Lord, what? He had to reject him, and he hated Esau. You got to realize this too. Verse 13, Jacob, have I loved Esau as I hated? Notice what Paul starts out with in verse 13. As it is written. See that? So he's giving a separate verse passage. And this separate verse passage is talking about a totally different idea at Malachi, wasn't it? Do you think Malachi was thinking election before birth? No. See that? So this is a separate verse topic. So this is a separate verse. This is just an additional note concerning Esau. That's all that it is by the context of the author. So what did we do? We'd seen context and scripture with scripture. If they accuse you of playing Bible roulette after that, you ask them this, show me one verse anywhere where it supported this in verse 13. You can't find one. You, on the other hand, you said context. You said the whole thing in context with scripture and scripture. They only did their own interpretation of context. 